theme of this talk is learning how to live in a finite world. What concerns me is not a global burgeoning population of 7.7 .7 billion people. It's that those people are increasingly carrying around inside their heads a model of what it means to be human, which derives from a very strange hybrid mixture of Western European thought, romanticism, the Industrial Revolution, capitalism, and the progressive dynamic that arose in the last 200 to 300 years and now threatens the planet. It derives particularly from a moment in time, a moment at the end of the 18th century, where the French Revolution and the American Revolution and the arrival of the Industrial Revolution and a form of cultural um, development called Romanticism all came together at once and they helped to create a further dynamic of progress and of economic growth. The problem with it is, is that together they have also created this model of an infinite planet. The idea that the planet has infinite resources or that it needs to have infinite resources so that the infinite desires of the human beings who live on this planet can be fulfilled. At the core of this mixture of economic theory, of the Industrial Revolution, of the arrival of technological innovation and great sources of power. The core of it is an idea derived from Romantic individualism. Romanticism, which starts really at the end of the 18th and early 19th century, is an attempt to work out a model of the individual as a creative person. That individualism is an expression of who we are through creativity of some kind. But what happened to that romantic individualism was that it became warped through capitalism with the idea that the way in which we express ourselves in modernity is by purchasing things. This idea of a uh, romantic individual being able to um, express themselves by buying and selling is at the heart of a corporatist capitalist culture in which we operate. So we have an infinite set of desires according to this model, that we have uh, infinite capacities for selfishness and greed in competition with each other. And we need an infinite planet in order to carry out these tasks because uh, we're also going to get all the resources that we need. Part of the romantic ideal was that human beings would be able to go out into the natural world, into wilderness, into other areas outside of the industrial world in order to find themselves. And this is one of the foundations for uh, the environmental movement. But it's also the foundation for technological giantism. The vast dams and other building projects, skyscrapers and the rest, which are part of the aspiration in the 19th and 20th centuries of human beings being able to somehow challenge both nature and the constraints that have hitherto bound us. So simultaneously with the uh, romantic individualism of environmentalists, we also get the romantic individualists of the great technological innovations of the 19th and 20th century. This shows how pervasive this idea has been and how it's been harnessed to a dynamic progressivism in the world today. And it is the culture against that the culture of thinking about what it means to be in a finite world that constitutes uh, a grouping of environmentalists, alternative politicians, uh, engineers, technicians, and people who are um, working towards the alternative. And it's this alternative way of thinking about the finite that is what particularly interests me. Human beings in this model of the infinite are now running up against the boundaries of a finite planet. This idea of a boundary around the planet changes the culture in which we live and changes the frame in which we can work um, out our ideas socially, culturally, politically, and spiritually. And it's a great struggle to actually change the way in which the infinitist model that has ruled our roost for the last couple of hundred years can be changed. So there's a couple of areas in which this is really important. One of them is if you draw a boundary of something, then everything within that boundary now becomes sensitive. It's like having a, a spider's web 
and the spider's web, which is very, very sensitive, now has a, a frame around it, and so everything within it now becomes utterly sensitive. And we began to see versions of this in the late 1940s and the early 50s, where we began to have, for example, the idea of nuclear fallout or DDT, where something would happen in one part of the world and it would spread over the rest of the world uh, without the people in the rest of the world having had any direct connection to how this happened. We now have a kind of sensitivity to a global web, not just in networks, but also in the physical ecological web of the planet. And this is something that's just happened over the past 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and is, of course, the foundation for the environmental movement. So the question that I have is, what happens when the infinite consumer, supposedly on an infinite planet, suddenly discovers that we are actually on a finite planet and that the burden of human activity, the dynamics of uh, self-interested economics, runs up against, smashes up against the actual physical boundaries of the planet. Not only is there a struggle against it by the people who are infinitists of varying varieties, on the other side, the people who are engaged in considering the finite nature of the planet that we are, are in all kinds of different areas. They are in uh, the arts, they're in the struggles of indigenous peoples, they're in environmental movements, they are engaged in different forms of political awareness, and what I'm suggesting is that they are all part of this particular movement. The label that I give to this movement is the idea of imminence. Imminence is the opposite of transcendence. There is this mental model of uh, an external god somewhere elsewhere who looks down on us or is the creator figure and that this figure is the person or the thing that we then uh, use as our reference point for whatever has gone wrong with us. But it's a very powerful myth or a very powerful image that human beings have, this idea that we need to go outside ourselves um, in order to find fulfillment. The idea that we are turning away from the transcendent towards the imminent is a very, very important moment in our history because it runs right up against the last 200 or 300 years of this drive towards everything all the time, everywhere. The ideas uh, of, again, um, this hybrid culture um, are expressed contemporarily in such images as this one from the Stockholm Resource Institute, which shows that this continuing drive towards um, economic growth indefinitely is running across various ecological boundaries that the planet cannot sustain. There is a discipline called ecological economics, which depends very directly on the scale of operations that human beings are engaged in in the world and then the materials that we produce and that eventually we have to throw out uh, or use as waste products have basically reached the carrying capacity of the planet. So when we look at that, we find ourselves in a situation where the actual physical planet upon which we operate is drawing this finite boundary, but it also has um, cultural, religious, and social implications. And it's those implications which is of particular interest to me here because it's basically been understudied and underthought. Some of this has to do with the uh, overwhelming effectiveness of the standard economic model of what constitutes a human being. And one of my arguments is that we are seeing a shift in the model of the human just as we're seeing a shift in the model of what constitutes um, the infinite planet or the finite planet on which we currently um, are struggling. We, when we take a look around us at the world, we can see the actual evidence of a planet reaching its boundaries, um, that the burden of human activity on the planet has become so extraordinary. And this idea of a planet that is reaching its boundaries or that um, we might be running up against um, some of the um, counter dynamics of a planet that has, is finite is having a profound cultural shift.
So in order to think about this in a graspable way, I have come upon the metaphor of the atomic bomb, which seems very strange on the face of it. But should you ever decide that you want to create an atomic bomb, please don't. In order to do so, what you need is to, first of all, have a casing around the bomb, which is the boundary. And then you have a series of uh, bits and pieces, fragments of the materials that are going to go into the final explosion. And what you do is you have a series of smaller explosions which drive all those pieces of materials into the center so there can be a final explosion critical mass uh, of the atomic bomb. This is what is called an implosion. And what I argue is that with the arrival of this finite boundary, we are experiencing an implosion of sensibility. A key expression of this implosion of sensibility is to be found in the extraordinary surge of interest in alternative traditions that focus on inward meditation, that focus on the disciplined use of the body in traditions like yoga, and on centering prayer in Christian traditions. An imminent theme that uh, shows up in many of these traditions is the idea of emergence. The idea that rather than again having an external creator come from outside to create things, that actually creativity comes from within. This idea of an implosion actually goes deep, not just into mythology, but into the logics of the way in which we think and we experience. The most accessible example of that is classical Chinese philosophy, Taoism. And um, it's because that uh, classical Chinese expression comes from a culture that did not have an external creator, and it, it generated what we could call an analogic or a correlative cosmology. It's a, it's a logic of imminence. Other related traditions like Zen and Tibetan Buddhism have also become popular over the last few years. And in the West, we have resurgence of uh, um, traditions such as Stoicism, which again focuses on a kind of interconnected cosmological feeling for the world that we see around us, a kind of imminent logic of belief. There are um, different ways of thinking about place in the world but that is um, uh, exemplified by various indigenous traditions and the recognition that contrary to what people think uh, that we live in the most materialistic culture in history in fact I would argue the opposite that we actually live in the least materialistic culture in history because if we cared about material objects we wouldn't treat them the way we do in fact, our, our interest in material objects is that they're holders of various mythologies. And when that mythology or the myths that are associated with those objects disappear, or we run out of our interest in them, then we throw those aside and go on to another object that might possibly contain myths. So we don't really care about materials. We don't really care about the material objects that we have around us. If we did, this would be a form of imminence. It would be a form of trying to treat the materials that we use and that we have around us every day, that we would treat them better, both when we produce them and when we use them as waste, but also the landscapes and the natural world around us, which is now uh, a central theme for people seeking alternatives to the great uh, corporatist capitalist um, engine that we see around us. So these movements to nature, these movements into different spiritual traditions, these movements into uh, interest in uh, indigenous traditions, in various traditions, is central to this idea of what I call an implosion of sensibility. So I see this as actually a fundamental struggle in the world between the people who are beginning to think of themselves as earthlings, as people for whom the imminent planet is precious, valuable, in fact, it's a space that we can enter into and discover the sacred and the spiritual, which used to be somewhere else, but is now maybe part of the world that we see around us. And this idea of a planet that is uh, worth the saving and is worth flourishing on is part of this whole cultural moment. And one of the things that's very, very important about the idea of an imminent sensibility is that 
we think about the conditions upon which we live as conditions and not constraints. If you decide that the earth is a cage, if you decide that it is something we need to run away from, then you feel constrained by it, and then you need to break the chains. You need to break the bounds that have hitherto bound us to this planet and go somewhere else or find some other way of um, machining the planet for our benefit. But if you believe in an imminent, imminentist philosophy, as I do, then it means that the conditions that we live in, the conditions that enable us to breathe and enable us to be human beings, are the things that we need to live in and protect. And those are the things that we need to make sure that we can flourish in because they are what makes us who we are. Part of this, again, goes to this idea of the model of the human. And an imminentist model treats us as if we were earthlings, as if we finally, finally are going to come into our own as people who are on the earth, of the earth, and always will be of the earth. And this way of thinking about it is still a minority view, but I think it's part of the dynamic that is going on in this part of the 21st century as we try and wrestle with the boundary effects of climate change and all the other things that are burdening us at, at the moment. It is this uh, arrival of the idea that this is our home and this is where we have to live and work and flourish that is the center of the possibility that we might actually be able to learn how to live in a finite world that technically, spiritually, scientifically, naturally, we can find the way of taking the dynamics of this beautiful planet we live on and making that the home of our future flourishing. In the end, I would like to state what I consider to be some of the ways in which the shift to the alternative way of looking at the world, which I consider to be an imminent view, will have different uh, effects. These would start with this idea of an imminent materiality as opposed to a transcendental ideality. The material things of the world are absolutely critical to um, a finite planet. What's really, really important is the idea of uh, emergence and not an external creator. No one is going to come for us, if I can put it that way, that um, out of the materiality of the world, out of the, the living processes of the earth, come the things that um, are part of an imminent world. Um, abundance, the world is fundamentally abundant, not scarce. Economic theorists go on about how the world is fundamentally scarce, but it's economics that makes the world fundamentally scarce. Underneath it all, the world is fundamentally abundant and can be made abundant again. Places and not spaces, that is, places that we're embedded in rather than rootless spaces uh, around uh, an infinite um, landscape, which we don't have. We are actually in a finite world. Um, what I call analogics, not logics. As I mentioned in Chinese philosophy, analogics are, are ways of thinking about the patterns of things that work differently than the standard logic in the West that has derived all the way back through to Aristotle. And uh, finally, I would mention inscape and not escape. Inscape is a word from the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, and it's about this, it's the sacredness that we can find, a sort of a uh, gateway into the sacred through a real uh, profound attention to the ecology of um, the planet. And it is that that is part of um, the feel that we um, are increasingly enjoying those of us who are subscribing to an imminent worldview that um, fuels the kind of work that we are doing in the environmental movement and elsewhere.